Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. I have been on the end of either watching someone die or killing someone. In so many different circumstances, mowing the lawn on a highway, and at any time, you can die. Please, we have a lady that's been shot. We should have the corner of Mall and Connecticut. Hurry up. Police, the FBI, U.S. Marshals, and Secret Service is looking for whoever is responsible for the worst murder spree that has ever happened here, including a murder today at the service station behind me. And you told me the old person has to die. Lee Marvel has to die. The young lady that I just seen about five minutes or ten minutes ago off the bus was laying right there and it was just terrible. We work on the next time what was wrong, what I need to change emotionally, in my approach, in my tactics. Nothing like this has ever happened in Montgomery County. Uh, this is a very safe community. Uh, our homicide rate just increased by 25% in one day. People aren't coming out as much. If you notice the streets, you're not getting the traffic on the streets now. As soon as, people, as soon as people get home from work, they stay in. They're not going out. Even the restaurants are, there's nobody in the restaurants. I mean, I, I was a monster. If you look up the definition, I mean, that's what a monster is. I, I was a ghoul. I was a thief. I, I, I stole people's lives. So I could murder a podcast and currently sitting at number one in the UK true crime podcast charts on Spotify. Whoa, whoa. Thank you so much, guys. We, we could have been cool about it and not mention it, you know, but we're not cool. And we've, <laughs> we're very surprised. Australia, we've just broke into the top 100. Uh, I think we're outside the top 100. And in New Zealand as well. And Ireland, we're doing all right. And in the UK, just for overall podcasts, we're sitting at currently at number five. That is nuts. Wow. Of any genre. Any genre, Fifth. yeah. Good number. Yeah, we're behind the Joe Rogans, your Peter Crouches. Uh, it, we, we're, we're very humbled mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah, very excited. And, it, and it's just it's lovely to see you, Ben. Yeah, off the back of that, for all the new people joining us via audio platforms, thank you so much. We really hope you enjoyed the episodes. We are also a visual platform, so if you haven't already, why not check out our YouTube page? And if you're a YouTube viewer, why not pop us in your ears sometime and take us for a little drive? Yeah, if you're mowing the garden, you can't watch us while you mm. mow the lawn, <laughs> can you? Well, there's an interesting lawnmower. I thought about that just as I said that. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get into that when we get into that. And also I want to say a quick hi to Jeremy and Victor in New Zealand who sent us a lovely message and just want to say um, big up to you guys and, and hello from across the globe. Yeah, I've got a lot of family over there, so a lot of love for New Zealand, so a big hello from us. Yeah. And a quick thanks to our friends at Gully Garms for dressing us this series. My t-shirt today is very on brand, very on mm. point, and it genuinely was an accident. The guy's like, oh, you're wearing that today? And I said, what are you on about? Back off. And then you're dressed... Yeah, well, the early roots of this case, we do get a bit tropical, and I thought I'd run with that theme. Well, I thought it was slightly tropical. I could see me sat on a beach, just the shirt. Saved by the bell vibes I'm getting. <laughs> extra. Large. No, an extra in it. Oh, an extra in it. But yeah, fine. I'm yeah. okay with that. Maybe like one that used to hang out at Screech, and Screech was like, fuck off. Screech told him to fuck yeah, off. Yeah, <laughs> that's where we're right. at. And Dan, um, how are you doing today? Uh, very good. Very good. Spring is sprung. Spring I have a sprung. spring in my step. That is lovely to hear. How's your garden doing? Ah, oh, I'm fuming. Yeah. First thing that Ben said when he came in. Oh, well, no. Now, what did you say? Leopard print. Like a leopard, yeah. About my uh, grass. Yeah. I really try. Big, I really a lot, lot of pride in his garden. I should have told you, Ben. He has a lot of pride in his and garden. You just told me to say it. You what else did you say, Ben? No, I said repeat what you said to Dan rather than say it behind his back. But you were, you were doing I like wasn't the stir in the pot motion. No, I wasn't. You, you knew what you said. And you're like, yeah, I'll tell him. I couldn't. I was carrying a bag. I couldn't do that. A bag of hate. 
And you just put it all over his garden. Anyway, Ben, today's case, this is very much one that you picked. Mm -hmm. I knew absolutely nothing about this case, but it is a fascinating one. It is, of course, the case of the DC snipers, also known as the Beltway snipers, also known as the Washington attacks. And uh, yeah, it's been a case I've been eager to cover since we started the podcast. Not quite like any case we've covered so far. There are elements that we could compare to previous cases we've covered, but this one, America was still very much in a state of healing from from the 9-11 attacks the year prior to this, almost exactly a year prior to this. Sometimes we get asked, and we do this when we went on a, a walk with two of our friends, Yian and James, uh, we talked about, you know, how would you, uh, how would you get away with the perfect murder? Yeah, you brought it up on your notepad out. Yeah. And you said, vulnerable people. I would go for vulnerable people. And I said, well, that's... It doesn't sound like that me. That is bizarre. <laughs> how would you commit the perfect murder? This case, for me, terrifying in both the fact that it was... Very random, although they a lot of planning to it, but in terms of their victims, they were very random attacks, untraceable, unpredictable. And I think compared to the cases we've previously covered, I would say this is as close as it gets to potentially getting away with murder. Obviously, they got lazy towards the end, uh, what well, one of the perpetrators did, and that was ultimately their undoing. But this is a, a very complex case, lots of layers, lots of stuff going on, and I'm excited to go through it. Yeah, it's like I've said before, it's an onion lasagna of a case, yeah. layer upon layer upon layer. So this case would take place just one year and one month after the 9-11 attacks. America and very much the wider world were still in a state of healing. And it's during this time that two individuals from very different social and religious backgrounds devised a plan that would again shake America to its core. We're of course talking about the perpetrators Lee Boyd Malvo and John Allen Muhammad. And we're going to start the case with an interesting quote from one of the perpetrators, Lee Boyd Malvo, which is worth keeping in mind as we talk about each of the perpetrators' backgrounds. So he would go on to say, Over the course of our travels, Muhammad and I did some very bad things, some terrible things. Muhammad was the master puppeteer. I was an instrument, a ghoul. I was a thief and I stole people's lives. And don't forget, guys, if you just simply can't get enough of the content, we do have a Patreon page. We do a new case every week, either in Minnesota or sometimes we do a thing called True Crime Times where we discuss the latest news stories in the true crime world. And why not head over there? It's roughly about a pound a week. Yeah, there's a whole bank of new content, over 60 episodes over there, and it's growing every week. Yeah, and on the back of that, we also do case requests over on Patreon. Speaking of which, our case request vote for the series went live tonight. So people are voting while we're filming, which is terrifying me. I still have those two cases in mind that I feel it's going to be. One of them has been rarely mentioned. Only one person, which I'm quite happy about. Yeah. But the other one's up there, guys. Why are you so intimidated by that case? It's just big, vast. Not compared to other ones we've done. Yeah, but other ones we've done, probably I've had time to get my teeth sunk into them. I don't know. Well... But yeah, no, the uh, the episode vote is live. It's not going to be next week, but it'll be the week after that we cover that case. So next week, there's a really big one coming your way. So please, if you haven't already, like the show on your audio platforms, follow the show on your audio platforms. And if you're on YouTube, please feel free to give us a little subscribe. It would mean the world to both of us and, and Dan. All three of us. I care, Dan. Okay, so Lee Boyd Malvo, who was 17 at the time of the attacks, was born on the 18th of February 1985 in Kingston, Jamaica. Malvo's mother, Una James, who was a seamstress, was 19 at the time of his birth, whilst his father, Leslie Malvo, who was a labourer and who was 44. Malvo described his parents as a match made in hell. I mean, I mean imagine that's a fairly large age discrepancy right there. Well, it um, is. Yeah, I imagine it is. But I'm imagining it now and it's in my head. And I'm like, that's... That's, she, he's quite a bit older than her. It's your Tinder set to your, your perimeters. <laughs> As we'll go on to explore, there were very different people, uh, his mother and his father. And there's an interesting dynamic at play here in that his father was very much the sort of soft and playful, you know, arm around the shoulder parent. Whereas his mother, quite the opposite. <laughs> you, again, you make it sound weird. Sorry. Abusive mum. Yeah, it's made, not... it, made it sound cheeky. I didn't mean it to sound cheeky. So yeah, his parents were polar opposites, both in age and personality. Not quite a polar, but on the way. And he was on the way as well. He was getting on a fair bit. So 44 and a 19-year-old. Malvo's father, Leslie, was very much the nurturer, who is said to have accepted people for who they were and lived a very laid-back lifestyle. Leslie would often protect Malvo when his mother, Una, became either physically or verbally aggressive. So there was, yeah, as I said, quite an interesting dynamic at play. Malvo's mother, Una, was very much the planner. She basically held 
incredibly high expectations for her son and she wanted the best things in life for both him and her. She wanted him to have the best education, the best clothes, the best opportunities. And she hated, this was a bit strange, she hated seeing Malvo playing as a child and would much prefer to see him spending time studying. She would go on to say, time spent playing is time you could have spent studying. Not very catchy, is it? No, it didn't. Get on a yeah. t-shirt. Yeah. Mm. She is said to have been physically aggressive to her son on multiple occasions and would often insist that Malvo obeyed her every command. She ruled with an iron fist, whereas the father was more kind of, ah, oh, just live your life, have fun. Taught him to ride a bicycle. You know, when he'd fall off, he'd pick him back up, whereas the mother was probably, get back in your room and study. It's like a football in reference. I'd say the dad was more like a Steve Bruce and the mum was a Simeone. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry if anyone doesn't like football. I mean, in, in politics, I guess. I don't really know politics. No, you don't vote for anything. Go on. You do a musical reference. Dad, Michael Bublé. Mum. Mum. We'll come back to that. I searched who's really mean and Jerry Seinfeld kept coming up. Oh, he's a big yeah. James Charles. Tricky, isn't it? It is tricky, on yeah. The football one worked because I had him in my that pocket. So before we continue with the case, we want to say a quick thank you to this week's sponsor, Manscaped. So as producer Dan said at the start of the episode, spring has very much sprung. And our friends over at Manscaped have the best tools for some spring cleaning. Spring cleaning. In, in your fucking pants. So as producer Dan said very kindly at the start of the episode, spring has very much sprung, Tom. Not what you said about his garden, but carry on. The grass is still very springy out there. Patchy, you said. I didn't say patchy. Oh, okay. Manscaped needs yeah. a bloody landscape. <laughs> yeah. That's what you said before we No, I don't think I remember saying it like I that. I bet if you put the crop revival out there... Well, yeah. Fuck you both. But you were also banging yeah. on about me about stealing my crop revival. I'll be honest, guys. The Manscaped Crop Reviver is the best below-the-waist grooming product I've ever used in my life. Tell me in depth how it makes you feel. In depth of how it makes me feel. Well, first of all, it makes me feel a little bit younger. Um, know, what, for, for, what, well, for shaving? No, no, no. <laughs> no, um, no. I, know, I knew it straight away, but you didn't. it didn't register... So first of all, it makes me but feel alright. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. No, don't clap. Yeah, don't clap. Right. Tom, the Crop Reviver truly brought me back to life. And our good friends at Manscaped don't only rely on the Crop Reviver. They've got a wide range of ball care bundles that have forever changed the male grooming game. So not only do they have the Crop Reviver, they have got Tom Crop Preserver. And the last thing you want is things sticking where they shouldn't stick. You slap a bit of preserver on, you're going to glide through those fields on a hot summer's day, worry-free. Truly worry-free. So worry-free. So guys, why not head over to manscaped.com and use our code ICMAP for free shipping and 20% off it. It really helps you, but it also really helps us. Why not spring up your life? Spring up your bowls. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. So Una would often beat Malvo if she felt he was being disrespectful or misbehaving. She was very much a disciplinarian. Throughout his childhood, teachers and neighbours would note that Malvo would always gravitate more towards the company of males and constantly crave a father figure. Ben, as you commonly say, a little bit of foreshadowing there. There is a little bit of foreshadowing there. There's going to be quite a lot of foreshadowing as Ooh, we go on. God, you mean you're um, excited. I'm very excited about this episode. <laughs> I wanted to cover the case, but now I know. just to uh, be foreshadowing it's so many... It's been on your list for a while, this one, isn't it? I suppose... No... Go She's on. still trying to think of nurture as the mother versus father dynamic. Okay, what about, um, so the dad's like the grandmother tree in Pocahontas, where the, the mum is like the mean bishop looking guy in Hunchback of Notre Dame. That's good. Lord Fire! That one, you know, yeah. you know what I'm on about? Uh, that's really good. He had a face like Steve Coogan a bit. I always thought that. So the couple were never married and Leslie would actually be made to leave Una and their child when Malva was just five years old. Una had decided that she didn't want to be in a relationship with a much older gentleman and that she felt she needed to be with someone who aspired to do more with their life. She also suspected that Leslie was cheating on her so one day she emptied their joint bank account and ended the relationship. So I'm not sure if they mutually parted ways there. There's a um, lot of different things going on there, isn't there? Emptying the bank account, the joint bank account. Yeah, um, not liking the age gap, suspecting foul play, wanting someone with a bit more... Get up and go. Get up and go about them. Um, See, I have, I, have, I have a theory. Yeah. If, if someone ever bails on you or they, you know, you get bad news from someone and they give you more than one reason, it's bullshit. If it's, I think he's playing away, I don't want to be someone older than me, <laughs> and da, 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 it's, it tends to be you a lie. you thought about it too much. Yeah, there's too many moving parts. It could just, it could just be one thing that I yeah. think... If it's like I'm stuck in traffic and my brother broke his leg. Yeah. Not relevant. Not relevant. Unless you broke his leg 
And let's yeah. look after him. I'm not, I'm, not, he, I mean, I'm not saying don't look after your brother who's broken his leg, but it's too much, too many layers to it. It's tense. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's iffy. Well, unless the brother broke his leg and that's what's caused the traffic and you're five or six cars back. I mean, I've thought about this now. So I'd get out of the car and make sure he's all right. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you wouldn't. So for numerous reasons, uh, Una decided that Leslie wasn't the one for her. This basically destroyed both Leslie and Malvo, who absolutely adored one another. Malvo viewed his father as, as a hero uh, and someone that he very much looked up to. And for him to no longer be in his life was a, was a big, big turning point. So when this happened, Una moved with her son to the small town of Endeavour in Jamaica, the other side of the island. And this was in order to be closer to her family, in particular, her older sister Marie, and they would stay in Endeavour for the following year. So there's actually mixed stories about the breakup, whether Leslie actually left them and didn't want anything to do with them, or it was all on Una. But by the sound of things with Leslie's relationship with his son, I mean, obviously we're going off hearsay in different reports, you kind of lean toward Una kind of... Yeah, packing her bags and giving it legs. One of the one of the documentaries I watched, there's an interview with Leslie, who is quite a sweet, sweet older gentleman. He's quite old by the time of this interview as well. But he got visibly distraught over the fact that he went to the Grand Canyon once without taking Malvo, and like properly broke down about it, saying I should have just took him with me. This was when they were together. He's got a heart, that guy. That guy's got a heart. Why would that have changed anything? Though? Made it clear that he was a guy that valued his son, probably regretted not taking him to the Grand Canyon. Well, I got that from that, yeah. And uh, broke down as a result of it. And I just thought, wow, this guy, <laughs> yeah, I'm saying this it guy's changed. got good values. Okay. Um, you know, maybe he still cheated on Una. Maybe he was, I don't know. But, you know, he came across well in that doc. Who's well? Is that the lady Leslie. he cheated with? <laughs> So Una would later return to Kingston with Malvo to try and find work opportunities. And when this didn't work out, they lived for a time on the small island of St. Martin, which is just east of Puerto Rico. Been on my list forever, that has. What has? Puerto Rico. Is it? Yeah. Long list, isn't it? It's getting longer by the week. Already now, he's, he's what, not even, not even nine, and he's moved several times. Three, yeah. Three times in, already. Um, I count that as a few. Uh, yeah, several. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, specifically several could be like three. I think a few meant four, three, three, isn't it? Three, a couple and, and a bit. Um, oh, a couple, couple's two. Yep. Yeah, well, three. a couple and several's a half. more. Apparently more than two, but not many is what several. That's Thank you. Official. Okay. But, Fuck. I'd say, but I'd say a few is three. Definitely. Yeah, a few, yeah, few is like three or four. People right? that say couple and they pick up three, I'm like, that's mental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll have a couple Pringles. <laughs> really? <laughs> half a cow. Even the man in the box looks pissed off. Tube. So when Malvo turned nine years old, he was sent back to Endeavour to live with his Aunt Marie, where he would spend almost a year. At this point, obviously, he's backwards and forwards um, a large number of times, as we've made very clear. And for such a young age, he's also technically been given up by both parents because his mum just kind of, cut, as we'll go on to see, she kind of comes and goes as she pleases, leaves him on his own, leaves him with different family members, different friends. Red, golden, green. A lot to process there. It's probably unfair to say his father... Gave him away though. We don't uh, know. We don't know that for sure. Went to the Grand Canyon without him. I know you said Is that, that you've already ticked it off your list, haven't you? Yeah. It's a picture of your butt out, isn't it? Mm. That's a big old crater. <laughs> okay, the canyon. <laughs> Many men have lost their lives there. <laughs> the Grand Canyon. So by the age of 11, Malvo had lived in over a dozen places and attended over a dozen different schools. So at the age of 11 and a half, Malvo actually attempted to hang himself on a mango tree in the back garden of his aunt's house in Jamaica. As soon as he started to hang himself, a friend of his mother's grabbed him and cut him down. So two days later, in Malvo's words, his mother beat him in a bloody pulp and asked him, why are you still here if you don't want to be here? It's counterproductive. Yeah, but if your son at 11 and a half Mm -hmm. even knows of suicide let alone attempts it it's kind of and she's treating him with contempt afterwards it's it's yeah, yeah it, whereas a mother you'd imagine you know would be you know so happy that he survived that and talking to him and trying to seek help she's she's punishing him even further yeah so malvo at this point obviously dealing with a lot of inner turmoil he's out of touch with his father feeling abandoned by his father but his mother at the same time the one person that's left by him constantly coming and going rarely being around for him he's obviously attempted to take his own life at, at such a young age all kind of impacts his sense of identity and his belonging and at the same time he's not just that one instance she frequently beats him up if she feels he's not studying hard enough or he's spending too much time out playing or misbehaving in whatever way so yeah there's no happy 
element of his home life right now. So while studying, Malva was described as the perfect student, and when he was in the sixth grade, Malva performed so well at an entry exam that he was sent to study at York Castle High School, which is widely regarded as one of the best schools in Jamaica, having educated some of the country's most highly esteemed leaders. So at this point, despite all the abuse and despite all the the trouble that Malvo had experienced so far, he had dreams of becoming a pilot as he grew older. And he was highly motivated uh, and, and a very capable student. He was able to absorb information and learn new things extremely quickly. What he would do is go to local internet cafes and spend almost all of his time playing flight simulators. Which are the most boring games. I was thinking about that on the drive over. I was thinking of the three of us, who would be most likely to play a flight simulator? Me, one hundred percent. Yeah, I didn't. I was do you think? Say would Dan. you do it, Dan? I used to play him. I thought he would. Uh, Not Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yeah, I think my brother, my brother used to do it as well. Have you seen the new one though? No. The graphics are nuts. Is it in I, real time, Dan? When you play them, right? Would flying take as long as? Yeah. That's cool. Is that cool? And they map the I'm whole the whole planet, the whole Earth. They've mapped so. Wow. It's great. Yeah, I just always found them. The funnest thing was just crashing the planes. Oh, okay. But, um, that's a red flag, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, that is a big red flag. What, do you play Grand Theft Auto and just go and do, the, do work, do you, mate? I do the taxi missions. I know where you go, mate. I know exactly what, what alleyway you're going down and mm-hmm. who with, all right? And then you're not paying. Um, okay. Is he into that because the idea of escaping? Is he um, playing a game that is so boring it might be considered studying if his mum sees it? It's not boring. <laughs> who are you lying to now? <laughs> I think the escapism is definitely a fair point because he can technically retreat into any part of the world he wants to. I mean, going off on a little flight simulator tangent here, Dan, but the more you play the game, the further you get to fly or is it just open world and you can go where you want? I couldn't tell you the details like that, no. But I mean, oh. you just fly a plane. It's cool. Like being up in the skies and flying it, being in control. I might play podcast simulator at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that in mind. A very capable student. Yeah, you wrote four, 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 shadow in. Yeah, four Fs. But I didn't. But he was getting A's and B's mostly. So at the age of 14, Malvo moved to Antigua to be reunited with his mother. Uh, and at this point, they'd been apart for five years. During that period of time, his mother had moved from St. Martin's over to Antigua and is continually relocating. Again, most of it is from what I could find, put down to trying to find different work opportunities and form new relationships. So she's moving continually. Her overriding goal was to go to America, though, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So like saving and scrimping in theory to do that? Yeah, potentially, yeah. So at this time, Malvo registered with a profoundly religious Seventh-day Adventist school where he would go on to achieve decent grades and would also win a school award in the 100-metre run. Look at Malvo go. Sorry. What was that? Sorry. What was that? Could that could come out. That could come out. I'm not even there. What was it? Um, look at Malvo Look go. at Malvo go. Go, Malvo, go. I've oh, done it again. Um semi-rhyme. Yeah. You do that sometimes. Some you think a joke do. is yeah. rhyme. And rhymes, yeah. So whilst studying, his mother would again uh, resume the pattern of abandoning Malvo. And at various points, she would leave Malvo alone for weeks at a time in a one-bedroom shack with no running water or heating. And despite this, he was able to go on to achieve fantastic grades. This is a key point in the timeline for Malvo because this is where he crosses paths with John Allen Muhammad. So Malvo went to an internet cafe, again, maybe to play his flight simulator. Well, read the Please! Um... (laughs) Tom, I'm sorry. I found a picture of Mike. Oh, I thought he was going to go. Look, I mean, yeah, but I don't. I, it, yeah, graphics are good. It looks like real life. But again, we're living in this day and age of like being in a being on a plane is one of the most boring things you can be on. Not if you're in control of the plane, surely. Well, you just press a couple of buttons and sitting back, aren't you? Wow. No offense to any pilots. Jesus listen. Christ. He was at the internet cafe called Zaza Electronics, where he would see a young boy playing a flight simulator whilst his father watched him. And the father was John Muhammad. So Malvo apparently, when seeing the interaction between John Muhammad and his son, he kind of had flashbacks to Leslie and like the good times they had together. And also, you know, we know he's fascinated with the flight simulator. So he went over there. He asked if he could actually watch and watch them play. And he was, he was kind of really enjoying that dynamic between them because I think John Muhammad with his with his sons were very. He spoke to them like adults. He didn't patronise them. Yeah. He supported them, and he was very encouraging. And that's some things he missed from his own father. So he went over there and immediately kind of hit it off with them. So hours went by at this internet cafe and John Muhammad actually went next door, returning with a couple of cinnamon buns and snapples for both of the boys, just dishing them out. And immediately Malvo felt like he'd found the father figure that he had longed for. Someone that was actually there, someone that was actually present, actually cared and actually listened, as as Tom said. He brought him the wrong favoured snapple. Is there more than one (laughs) flap? 
Yeah, there's lots of flavours of Snapple. It's not apple. It's an array of flavours and has a little fact on it. I thought they were all because they were Snapples kind of apple orientated. I don't think they are. I thought they Mind were based around pine apple. Pineapple would work, wouldn't it? I mean, again. Uh, there's kiwi on here. Wow. So we've got peach. Um, peach Snapple. Tell you more nice. that... Well, no, I mean, we've we've gone in depth onto flight simulators. I thought, why not talk about some Snapples? Number one in short. on Spotify right now. <laughs> and number five. In true crime, not Snapple rate, ratings. But yeah, you're wrong. It's um, not, not <laughs> Apple-based, by the way. Why do they call it Snapple? No, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to correct you there. It's Snapple's... Go on, Dan. Snapple's yeah, near yeah, the all, top. All of the drinks are apple and pear juice concentrate as a foundation. Yes. Yeah, but that's like saying every milkshake is all milk flavoured. It took five because series. the foundation no, no, so they're based it. around apple. Yeah, yeah but it's literally. based. Yeah. A milkshake yeah. is based around. I guess you could based say it's milk. Yeah. It took five series, but I've finally done him. I know. I think Dan did me there. <laughs> well, I needed Dan's support, but I've done him. I don't know. Ben, don't just know. take it. I'm, I'm cool with it. Thanks, man. Apple. Uh, Fly simulator is fla- not that bad. Apple flavours. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying fizzy drinks are all based around a bubbles. Oh, <clears throat> bubbles. Just let it go, Tom. I will, mate. I mean, that's true, though. Fizzy drinks are kind of, that's the one commonality they have. Bubbles. So you're right in your example. It's not flavours. No, but apple is a flavour. He's got you. No, if I give you, I've got him again. If I give you four Snapples, <laughs> but if People you, have been if waiting five series for this. Have they? From, People are going to be buzzing about this. My parents to are going to start watching again. <laughs> So Malvo's mother, Una, first met John Mohammed a few weeks later after Malvo introduced the pair. They immediately formed a close relationship. John Mohammed was a very well-liked and popular member of the local town and was notable for being a great dad to his three children, despite raising them by himself. This is really strange. So he's an American-born man living in Antigua, single uh, male father. He gets a lot of sympathy in, in, in the footage I've seen about being the perfect kind of townsman. Anyone that needs something doing anything helping he's the man to, to fix it he'd convinced the whole town he's raising them by himself because his wife abandoned them and, and and fleed to america whereas in actuality he was in antigua with his three children because he'd kidnapped them and taken them to antigua from america from the mother so john uh, mohammed an american born man malvo obviously born in jamaica they've both their paths have crossed in antigua and Malvo immediately captivated by this male role model that he has craved all of his life. So it turns out John wasn't actually living this clean life and being that helpful guy in the town. He'd actually been rubbing shoulders with various criminals over there and con men. And he was making money by bringing locals to them who were seeking false passports to travel to America with. Something that he would go on to do for Malvo's mother, Una. And Una again left her son Malvo, this time leaving Antigua for Florida, using a fake passport. She left Malvo in the care of John, which, I mean... I'm not sure how long the time had passed here, but still. It's a man as well that she knows has sorted her out with a fake passport, so yeah. she knows he's a bit dodgy. So Unless she saw him with the flight simulator and thought, nah, he's harmless. He's not going to do well, it. Him being a landed plane and him raising a son are very different things. Everybody seemed extremely happy with this arrangement. Yes, yeah, so Malvo obviously would be chuffed with that. His abusive mother leaving and leaving him with, you know, his replacement father in, in a way. So when Malvo was left with John Mohammed, Mohammed convinced him to convert to Islam. And at the same time, Mohammed began to isolate Malvo from his mother, just like he had done with his own children and their mother. So it's more kind of not letting them talk and communicate while she was away. It's very interesting, that dynamic. And This feels a lot like grooming to me. Certainly heavy manipulation at that. I don't think yet, because just saying to him... But he's, he's isolating him from his mother. But then isolating from his mother is something that Malvo wants, isn't it? I don't think Malvo was sad that his mother left. So Malvo, using John uh, to provide him with false travel documents, arrived illegally in Miami in 2001. And in December of that year, he and his mother Una, who had uh, previously uh, reunited in America, were apprehended by the Border Patrol in Bellingham. Washington. The following month, they were released on a $1,500 bond, and once released, Malvo then began to live in a YMCA homeless shelter with John Mohammed in Bellingham. So again, John travelled over with him. It, there's a lot of different locations so far in the early part of this case, but they are now reunited all together and they're living in America. And it's during this time that they were living in the YMCA that Malvo enrolled in Bellingham High School with Mohammed falsely listed as his father. He did not make any friends and kept very much to himself, would then go straight back home to the YMCA to be with Mohammed outside of school. So very different to... Uh, the, the life he was living in Antigua and in Jamaica. And we are going to go into John Mohammed's background as well, which will go into his military background. So it's just a bit of information that's relevant to the, this particular paragraph. John Mohammed convinced Malvo to shoplift the Bushmaster XM-15 rifle from Bullseye Shooter Supply, and John would then encourage Malvo to practice his marksmanship on the Bullseye firing range over the road from the gun shop. Risky to steal the gun from there. And, and then use the their practice range, yeah. 
John, with many years of military experience, began to coach Malvo in order to prove his aim and firing abilities. Yeah, so obviously this is a slight escalation and the first uh, kind of element of weaponry that we've explored. But uh, at this point, because both of them had been arrested by Border Patrol, they had been listed as not legally allowed to purchase or possess guns due to their previous arrests. And that was why John convinced Malvo to uh, shoplift the Bushmaster. So they were classified as prohibited persons under the Gun Control Act of 1968. At this point, again, anything that John tells Malvo to do, he just does without questioning it. He's won him over. He's captivated him. Malvo is completely uh, manipulated by John. I mean, he describes him as the master puppeteer. And it's here that John Mohammed puts into motion his plan to cause widespread terror across America using Malvo as the weapon. So John Allen Muhammad, who was 41 at the time of the attacks, was born John Allen Williams on December 31st, 1960 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We didn't have any kind of little tidbits, Ben's little tidbit facts uh, about Malvo's childhood. Not throwing any shade at Baton Rouge. Ooh. The name, the, that I recognise that town or city or place. And I did a little Google because I was like, I'm sure we've covered another case where Baton Rouge has been a birthplace. And I read an article that said since 1997, there have been five serial killers that murdered a combined 70 people, Whoa. all of whom were from Baton Rouge. Well, if you're not bringing interesting facts to the table, then someone has to. Okay. What was a fun fact about Baton Rouge? Baton Rouge was the site of the only battle in the American Revolution that occurred outside the original 13 colonies. <laughs> Fucking hell, boy. Let's go. Turn off the mics. I'm going to Baton Rouge. Nah, but you, this is like not much has happened. <laughs> but I'm a lot of deaf. A lot of deaf over there in Baton Rouge. But if you're from there, let us know in the comments where we should visit. We're not going. But if we did. So John was born to Ernest and Eva Williams. Initials O. Ernest Williams worked on the train line and Eva worked in a restaurant. The family moved to New Orleans not long after John was born. When John was three, his mother unfortunately passed away from, as a result of breast cancer. After his mother passed away, John's father Ernest abandoned him and then John was mainly raised by his grandfather and one of his aunts. So again, a very kind of difficult childhood. Yeah. Uh, losing a family member early on. I know with Malvo, it was, his father was it was a different kind of loss, but still, you know, it's not a solid household uh, raising them. Yeah, there's some, some similarities there for sure. So despite a little bit of bullying by other children in his neighbourhood, John had an otherwise unextraordinary ordinary uh, childhood in a very much working class environment working various farming roles uh, as a child he lived in a house that was shared by three separate families they always got the worst of everything leftover food hand-me-down clothes and very limited opportunities for a good education and good jobs in august of 1978 uh, mohammed decided to enlist in the louisiana army as a combat engineer he was then transferred to the regular army seven years later and during this time he was trained up to be a mechanic, a truck driver, and a specialist metal worker. So perhaps another equally strong student. Yeah, and um, his mechanical skills would come into play a lot later on. Um, he'd also qualify with the Army's standard rifle, the M16, earning the Expert Rifleman's Badge. And this is an extremely challenging accomplishment to achieve, and is the Army's highest level of basic rifle marksmanship but from a soldier. Again, something that's very prevalent later on. And throughout his time, he was highly trained in sniper tactics. So Mohammed then went on his first tour with the army at Fort Lewis in 1985. In 1987, at the age of 27, John joined the Nation of Islam, and it was as part of this group that he would go on to help provide security for the Million Man March in 1995. In the early 90s, John married his first wife, Carol Hutchinson. However, this was an extremely turbulent relationship in which Carol uh, would go on to describe John as a monster. He was frequently physically and emotionally abusive to her, and it's said that that a lot of his aggression was kind of based on trauma that he experienced in the army. Yes, yeah, so just to explain the Million Man March to anyone who, who's not aware, that was a large gathering of African-American men in Washington, D.C. on October 16th, 1995, and it was held on and around the National Mall. So this is a meeting of civil rights activists, and um, it was to unite in self-help and self-defense against economic and social ills plaguing the African-American community. This is something that would very much follow John Muhammad for the rest of his, his life in terms of his beliefs after the war. Yeah, he, he, he was um, very driven 
uh, by what he learned through these experiences. So in 1991, John served as a rifleman in the Gulf War, and he was involved with a company that dismantled Iraqi chemical weapons. And as a result of this, he would actually go on to receive numerous prestigious medals and accolades. So not a lot is noted about John's time in the Gulf War. However, it's widely speculated that he did suffer significant trauma during his service and potentially also experienced neurological damage as a result of various chemical weapons he was exposed to. So with his wife at the time saying that when John returned from the Gulf, she noticed massive changes in his behaviour with him being quick to anger and quick to physical violence with a noted difference in political stance. So yeah, he experienced lots of different things during this war that changed his kind of values as a person but also his political stance he was exposed to serious violence and after 16 years of service and as a veteran of the first gulf war john was honorably discharged from the army in 1994 with the rank of sergeant now obviously we've we've discussed this in previous episodes we're not we're not gun gun people and i'm gonna go out on a ledge and say we're not really army people as in understanding ranks of army i would say i'm not but i could be wrong i support my men in the army do you understand the ranking system? No, I'm just saying I support. Oh, we all we all support them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I thought you were Sorry. saying that you didn't. Oh, not at all. If it came across that way, guys, I'd take it all back. Um, but I feel just, like I was. You've stolen valor before, haven't you? But I did a little bit of uh, research on this, and multiple articles suggested, and, and bear this in mind as we go on to look at the uh, the cracks that start to appear with John. They did suggest that Sergeant was not a massive rank to reach, considering he'd given 16 years of service. They said that that was fairly... He'd only gone up a few ranks. So there's apparently, this is what we've Googled, 13 ranks in the army, and he reached number six. Okay. So that's is that kind enough? Of every, is that enough for you? Every couple of years, he's gone up a level. No, not even that. Rank? Every three years, he's gone up a level. A rank? rank. Yeah. That's, that seems okay, progression-wise. So yeah, some of the articles are read, guys. And if you are a military uh, buff, it suggested Sergeant wasn't that great for 16 years of service. Don't slag him off, Ben. Well, I'm not slagging them off. I'm slagging John off. And, and I, any uh, sergeant out there? No, 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 no. If you're a sergeant and you're happy, because some people consistent That's at a level. That's it? Well, no, well, no, and, well, and you're happy. No, well, happy, you know, comp... Um, so one rumour that I read... Um, do you want to get me out of this hole that I've got myself? Ben hates army people. no. That's, did that come across like that? Because that's not... <laughs> this is your whole boy. Your trench. Uh, you said we were an army people. Sounds like I probably, I probably am. But um, <laughs> It said that he was honourably discharged and I couldn't find out why or what that reason was because he's still fairly young at this point. But one rumour that I found floating about is that he was discharged due to the fact that he fell out with a fellow sergeant and as a result of this fallout, he actually ended up throwing an incendiary grenade into that sergeant's tent. Dan, do you know what an incendiary grenade is at the top of your head? I feel like I should because I play loads of Warzone and they do mention that quite a lot, but no, I don't. Is that like a stunner grenade? Yeah, I can't... can't, A a frag grenade. A stunner grenade. It's just stone cold comes out and... Oh, it's got white phosphorus in it. Ooh. It burns. Would that just hurt someone? It wouldn't kill them? I think white phosphorus can be fatal. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's not a playful grenade in the tent. It's quite the opposite. Uh, I'd say you never be a playful grenade. Don't try and think of playful grenades. Water bombs. They're not grenades. No. And even then, a water bomb into the tent is just going to annoy people. Yeah. I'd be less annoyed with that than a, a severe burn. <laughs> <laughs> On leaving the military, John began to harbour a huge amount of bitterness and resentment towards his country and the military. He experienced a, a lot of trauma, as we said, in the Gulf War. It changed him as a person. He'd obviously had a fairly challenging upbringing as well. And this thrown into the mix led to the development of someone that some people have argued is, is psychopathy. Other people have argued it's just a, a highly traumatised individual. But he would come back uh, to America with a lot of resentment and a lot of bitterness. And he would then end up kind of taking this out on his wife and children. He would behave incredibly unpredictably, which made his wife and children extremely scared of him. So a lot of people, again, said... In Antigua, he was a charming man, great Mm -hmm. parent. He was able to switch it on and off, but he was very volatile. So as quickly as he could charm someone, he could very... Harm someone. Quickly harm someone. You weren't going to say that. I was. There you go. You could see my my rhythm. So in October of 2001, John Allen Williams changed his name to John Allen Muhammad, having also become incredibly involved with the Nation of Islam. So Muhammad divorced Carol Hutchinson before getting married once again, this time to his second wife, Mildred Muhammad. The pair went on to have three children together, two girls and one boy. Um, and this is where we get to the point where Muhammad will go on to kidnap those children and take them to Antigua around 1999, and during which time he engaged in a credit card and immigration document fraud 
and during this time Mildred sought and was granted a restraining order, alleging abuse and the fear that he would murder her and their children. This resulted in the second divorce from Mohammed, and it is widely believed as a spark that lit the fuse for the tragic series of events. So when she threatened him with this restraining order and the fact that he wouldn't then be able to say, see his children, this is when he decides, right, if, if I can't see them, I'm taking them. Yeah, there's actually some court, just audio, because he went to the court thinking he'd be able to argue his case, he'd be able to state, you know, the relationship there, but he wasn't able to say that, and he was literally just there for formalities, really, to say, that, and they're going to Mildred, you're not, you're not seeing your children anymore. And you could kind of hear in his voice that he's very, like, disappointed and kind of shocked mm-hmm. and stunned. He wasn't outwardly angry, wasn't, like, lashing out, he just kind of went a lot quieter. Yeah, I think that's when the cog started turning there. So we talked about John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo reuniting in America, and it's at this point that John Muhammad had lost his children, so there's a lot of rage now building up in him in, in wanting to be with his children, not wanting to have them taken away from him. He's also viewing Lee Boyd Malvo as the, you know, a son of his own. Definitely, yeah. And it's at this point that they start their, quote, training. As we go on to say, there's lots of speculation about brainwashing and manipulation. There's definitely manipulation going on here, but he, he he's getting uh, Malvo to play a lot of sniper games, games which is involving guns. He's making them watch lots of documentaries about snipers over and over again. Malvo's shot was apparently incredible, and I think um, John even bragged to some of his mechanic mechanic friends that his shot was better than his. Mm-hmm. We've also said how you know how John's shot was. He won awards with that in the army. So his skill set, in his eyes, it was, it was very much his kind of protege, kind of a really build him up. And also though, he's also making him watch things like the matrix yeah so he's making malvo uh watch the repeatedly watch the matrix and a tv series called roots which essentially tells the story of the first slaves uh, first black slaves arriving in america so he's using this to kind of indoctrinate malvo and there's a quite a, a powerful quote that muhammad is said to have forced on to to malvo which is every young black man is a god and he must never forget the wailing of his forefathers and remember that bloodshed begets bloodshed. With the Matrix thing as well, though, he's not just a case of showing him it. John claimed that he was Morpheus, and he claimed that Malvo was was Neo. The whole idea of people, people say in terms of um, certain warfare, like long range warfare, or even in in if you're in the sky, it doesn't feel real. It's very disconnected to what it is doing. Mm-hmm. And if you're playing a game like you know Call of Duty, it's fun because you're killing what you're killing. It's just you know it's graphics. It's, it's not real. Uh, yeah. But he's very much trying to establish the idea that they're in a matrix. They're in yeah. a kind of you know it's not reality. This is games. This is sniper. This is fun. You enjoy doing this. All these things wrapped together and to kind of really disassociate and i guess if what they were going to do it wasn't well some parts of it were very personal and some parts weren't but he, he's making it seem like a game seem like yeah. something he's proud of him he's such a great shot why don't you do this and all this stuff and obviously malvo just wanted to do anything to please john exactly because he's scared that john's going to leave him like everyone else has left him that's it so he's gamifying this whole plan and then rewarding him with praise and, and love and someone to be there for him i mean throughout their relationship they never had a crossed word there was one incident where they were playing basketball together they played one-on-one muhammad absolutely dominated malvo left him bloodied and battered on the floor but they didn't say a word and that was it but other than that they got on they he idolized muhammad and it's here that muhammad then says and and again you could blame the fact that his children have been taken away from him he's got the restraining order in place well he's had a restraining order put in place against him but he begins this mission this divine mission that he wants malvo to be a huge part in and it's built up by three separate phases which are quite terrifying so yes phase one is 25 murders per week for four weeks Phase two, murder police officer and then blow up his funeral, killing other officers, like hundreds of officers. And phase three, demand $10 million from the US government for killings to stop. So it's very thought out. A lot of the killings were random, but a lot of the killings weren't random. And that's one of the things people believe the motive to be based around is it was kind of to shield something that John actually wanted to do, something he actually wanted to kill. Uh, but we'll, we'll get on to that. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's a very calculated... John's a very clever man and very manipulative man, as we've gone into. Like the whole manipulation of, of Malvo is... Yeah, it's, it's, it's baffling, you know, how he, how he just kind of already knows how to do that. And now we're going to get into the timeline for the DC snipers. So 16th of February, 2002, John takes Malvo to an unknown house that he's never been to before, and he instructs him to do something, which is in his part, he thinks it's for training purposes. He basically said to him, you're going to have to go to the front door and no matter who answers, you're going to take your gun out, take it to their face and shoot them dead. So yeah, as I said, Malvo hasn't got any context as to why this house, he thinks it's a completely randomly chosen spot, but we'll go into a bit of the context as to why this place was picked after all. So Malvo would approach the door, he knocked on the door, and a young lady answered the door. It wasn't the person that um, John described in the first place, but he was told, and he was instructed to kill whoever answered the door. He could hear a young baby in, in another room crying, 
but he still pulled out the gun and shot the person square in the face and killed them. And then he left instantly. So yeah, and, and the young lady was called Kenya Cook. So yeah, that's a huge escalation um, from going from play, just playing games, practicing at the shooting range. He's now done this, you know, because he would do anything to keep John happy and make him proud. But the kind of further context from this was this house actually belonged to a friend of Mildred, uh, John's ex-wife's house, who apparently was kind of integral in the kind of court case for him yep. losing custody. So he didn't just pick this house at random. He wanted to target this house. And it turned out Kenya was actually her niece. And she was staying there with, with her son after leaving an abusive relationship. So Malvo would actually go on to say, you know, he actually spoke to her for a bit and made her laugh and a joke with her before pulling the gun out and shooting her square in the face. Yeah. Kenya would um uh, would pass from her wounds, leaving a six-month-old baby in, in the house. So, yeah, it's horrible scenes. And this just goes to show the kind of level that Malvo has been. Um, I, th I think brainwash is is fair in my opinion but this just goes goes to show how far Malvo has gone on this journey with John on March 19th 2002 Jerry Taylor who was a retired Vietnam veteran uh, was practicing chip shots at a Tucson Arizona golf course at this point he receives a single shot to the chest fired from long range and that was revealed to have been fired by Malvo Mohammed's sister lived near the golf course when he was visiting her during the time of the shooting. So August 1st, 2002, John Gator is changing his tyre after it's been slashed. Little did he know Malvo was the person who actually slashed it. And then he's shot by Malvo with the bullet entering his neck and leading through his back. He falls to the floor and he plays dead. When, whilst he's laying there pretending to be dead on the floor, Malvo steals his wallet and leaves. Then Gator somehow miraculously is able to stand up and go to a petrol station in order to use the phone to call for help. He goes to hospital and they discharge him after an hour, which yeah. being shot in the neck. And it's, it's enough of a, an injury for him to have been able to successfully play dead while Malvo robbed him as well. Mm. Yeah, so that's a significant blood yeah, loss. Yeah, definitely, yeah. As we said earlier, it's a real escalation there from just playing you know, video games to, to that. So on the 5th of September 2002 at 10.30pm, Paul LaRuffa closed up and left his restaurant, Margelia, carrying his laptop and briefcase containing around $3,500. Now when getting into his car, Malvo appeared and shot Paul five times. Malvo then stole the laptop and money, promptly leaving the scene. An employee at the restaurant luckily saw this and called 911. Paul was taken to a trauma centre where he was treated for his multiple wounds and miraculously, he survived. Now on his shooting, Paul LaRuffa would go on to later state, Before I could start the car or do anything, the window next to me just exploded and shattered glass all over me with the first shot deafening my left ear. And the rest of the shots came in and they all hit me. It was mind boggling. Your world changes in a split second. It was later revealed that Malvo and Mohammed had staked out the restaurant for the previous two nights, deciding to attack after after they were confident they knew Paul's routine. So you could argue perhaps that there was like a slight financial motive to this one if they knew he was closing up and he'd, he'd been, you know, taking the takes for the day. You must do, because like a lot of things in this case and a lot of things you hear is the randomness. And it does happen later on, but you know, why are they mm -hmm. surveying him? For two nights. Yeah. Yeah. If it, if it is completely like, oh, we'll just kill random people. No, there, there's obviously some thought behind it in regards to picking the victims early on. 14th of September 2002 in Silver Spring, Maryland, 22-year-old Rupendir Oberoi is shot outside Hillendale Beer and Wine by Malvo. An off-duty Washington police officer came to Rupendir's aid and called an ambulance. He suffered damage to his kidneys and liver and lost a portion of his stomach from the single bullet but lived. I've seen the wound pictures from this. Yeah. It's absolutely horrible. So on the 15th of September, the following day, 32-year-old Mohammed Rashid is closing Free Roads Liquors when he is shot by Malvo. Mohammed Rashid would go on to survive. So it's at this point that the the pair feel that Malvo has received adequate training and they now want to start working more rapidly towards completion of phase one. And it's at this point that the pair purchase and modify a blue 1990 Chevrolet Caprice, which essentially they modified to operate as a rolling sniper's nest. So they basically had a lever that would allow the back seats to lower down so that Malvo could lay in a prone position, pointing his gun directly out of a very small hole slightly above the the license plate and that way it looks like a normal car on the outside but on the inside and there's there's some really interesting diagrams of how this worked and what it looked like and there was also then a bungee cord that allowed them to very quickly return to a normal mm. uh, position for the getaway i mean the getaway. and a big shout out to phil for his yes. animation at the start of this which it shows off kind of how you know this this car is looking it looks like a, a you know 
your bog standard car. And then that, that's the thing about this case that just, because I didn't even know about all of the preliminary killings that they did as their training. Mm. So during that time, they've killed seven people just yeah. in this training portion. What really drew me to this was the fact that from the outside, it's a it's a, an unassuming car, looks completely ordinary. If they're conducting these murders in the right location, no one's going to think if they hear a loud bang, oh, it came from that car. Mm. And even then, sometimes you get really old cars like this one where sometimes they might, you know... <laughs> There yeah. you go, yeah. Was it called a... We're not car guys either. Damn, was it called one of car that backfires? So they've converted their, their car. Once inside that Convertible. allowed... Convertible. Once inside that allowed Mal, either Malvo or Mohammed to lie prone and take shots through a small hole just by the license plate. So yeah, one of them would drive, the other one would lay in the back. And then if they, you know, had to pull over for whatever reason, they had an operation in place where they could very quickly resume and look like an ordinary yep. ordinary car. So very um, simple, but very effective. Because John, he had a mechanical background, didn't he? So him modifying a car and even probably him spending time in the workshop doing it, easily he could get away with different alibis for doing it. And plus again, gamifying it for Malvo, making him seem detached from it. If he's yep. in a dark boot and he's not able to see anything other than, other than down the scope of his rifle, yep. just feels less attached to it. Definitely, yeah. If you're attached. Yeah. So the 3rd of October 2002 at 7.41am, so this is after this car has been modified, James Buchanan, known as Sonny, is mowing the lawn at Fitzgerald Auto Mall when he is shot by the snipers. Witnesses gather around Sonny as he stumbles from the lawnmower. An ambulance is called, however, by the time it gets there, 10 minutes later, Sonny is dead. To the shock of the witnesses who thought the loud bang was the lawnmower malfunctioning, the cause of death is the bullet wound to the left side of the chest. So apparently the scene here was, you know, he, he did run, Afterwards, he got shot, then he did run, left the lawnmower, still kind of wearing away and getting going off to one, one, one way. And apparently, you know, an upstanding citizen recently engaged, so yeah, very sad indeed. So Sonny had just relocated from Maryland to Virginia, concentrating his efforts on his family's Christmas tree farm, which sounds like a magical place to work. Mm. Sonny was a member of the Montgomery County Crime Stoppers, oftentimes providing products from his landscaping business for fundraisers. He spent numerous hours teaching the children in the Boys and Girls Club how to plant a seed, nurture it, and watch it grow. The family created Sonny's kids in his memory. It provides funds for a college education to underprivileged children. Yeah, this is the one that really stuck with me because apparently the scene was so gruesome and so bloody that they believed a blade had been malfunctioned out of, oh, the, wow. out of the lawnmower because it must have got him in a vital organ or, mm. or something like that and even some of the 911 calls are saying look it's a malfunction lawnmower there's a lawnmower exploded and this guy's you know bleeding mm. left right and center so yeah all they see in the street i guess is just an ordinary car an ordinary blue car just passing by no reason to question it so shortly after this, at 8.12 a.m., Prem Kumar Walakar is filling his taxi cab at a mobile petrol station. He is then fatally shot by the snipers. 8.37 a.m., Sarah Ramos is sitting on a bench reading in front of the post office just over a mile away from the previous shooting. She is shot by the snipers. The bullet passes through her head and into the crisp and juicy carry-out restaurant nearby. She dies almost instantly. At this point, three people have died in the past 56 minutes. The police realise they are in the middle of a mass shooting. They send every officer available to patrol the area, ordering them to wear their bulletproof vests. Park police, state police and police from surrounding areas are then called in. There's one clue gained from interviewing witnesses at the shooting of Sarah Ramos. Someone described two men in a white box truck with black lettering speeding away from the scene. All across the area, please stop and search white delivery vans. Well, this is a year and a month after the 9-11 attacks. It's in, it's in the general DC area. People are starting to believe that perhaps another terrorist attack is taking place. So widespread panic and lots of different environments as well. Petrol station, shopping mall, uh, restaurant so no west appears safe at this time 9 58 a.m meanwhile laurie ann lewis rivera pulls into a shell petrol station in kensington maryland in order to use the coin operated hoover to clean her minivan she removes her daughter's car seat and begins to clean her minivan when a single bullet hits her she then drops to the ground and witnesses report finding laurie ann under her van door with blood trickling from her mouth she dies not long after this that's another thing to point out with this. There's not a clear motive of who they're picking. It is, does appear random at this point. It's different ages, it's different sexes, it's different races. It, it, anyone could be a target. And that's the really kind of disconcerting thing for the police. Even though the police were given that, that witness statement, it was wrong, obviously, because we know that it's a, it's a blue vehicle. They were looking for white vans. So um, the police are already on to a, the wrong tip there. And also now they've got a wrong tip they're chasing. And anyone, literally anyone, could be a target. 
during yeah. this period. So To go back to the Sarah Ramos one as well, because she was sat on a bench on her own by a restaurant, because there was literally no one else in sight, I remember hearing the 911 call and they all said, oh, this lady's just committed suicide. So they were convinced it was because it was a gunshot mm. to the head that she just killed herself. There was no one else they could even yeah. see holding a gun. And they, they were blaming all of these incidents because there was no weapon at the scene and no suspect at the scene. As obviously with Sniper as well, they're going to be a distance away, aren't they? Yeah. So And like Malvo in the shooting range was hitting targets at 300 metres, wasn't he? Like, bang on. So it'd be a, a very long distance away already and then make the getaway. So 9.20pm, Pascal Charlotte is walking to a bus stop on Georgia Avenue, Washington, D.C. He is shot and killed by a single bullet. Pascal was 72 years old. The ages really do vary here. So within 27 hours, six people had died, each apparently with a single long-range bullet used. So it, it goes to show, you know, that in terms of the aim, they were getting, you know, immediate deaths with those shots. And within days, the FBI alone had around 400 agents around the country working on the case. They set up a toll-free number to collect tips from the public. Police had over 100,000 tips coming on the tip line. Evidence experts were asked to digitally map many of the evolving crime scenes, and behavioural analysts helped prepare a profile of the shooter for investigators. So this profile was not helpful whatsoever, it turns out. And a lot of these cases we've done, the FBI profiles have been absolutely spot on. Uh, with this, they thought they were weekday warriors, so people working Monday to Friday, they thought they were 20-something year olds or in their 20s, and they thought they were white men in their 20s as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is uh, two black men, one in his 40s, the other in his teenage years. They don't have jobs, so they're not weekend warriors, which is a weird thing to say anyway, as a kind of trait of someone who's going to be committing these crimes. Yeah, it's likely a weekend warrior. Weekday warrior even stranger yeah yeah uh, and that assumption was based largely on the characteristics of past serial killers using the weapon of a sniper rifle which again was a bit of a um, false narrative because they assumed that it's most likely a white males that would use a sniper rifle when in fact the figures that's odd isn't it they also at this point as they're trying to put a profile together trying to look at the uh, logistics of each attack they put together the concentric circle plan which basically meant that the law enforcement saw the pattern and they realised that all of the shootings had taken place close to major roadways and that certain stores were consistent at these places so they found that most of them had either a, a, a petrol gas yeah. station nearby they also found out that the snipers were able to very quickly escape using the major roads and they made made sure to go through the path of least resistance in terms of traffic so they would always go the opposite direction mm. to again though at this time for the first two or three weeks they're all convinced it's white males in white vans mm. so the amount of time they've spent chasing the the wrong leads here could have prevented far more people from losing definitely their lives. i mean as well obviously the police being bombarded with a hundred thousand tips it's so easy to sit here and say well, why don't they just follow that one a police officer actually pulled over john on october 3rd after he ran two stop signs just two hours before he fatally shot pascal charlotte again it's one of those where well he didn't fit the description yeah. what they were looking for so of course they just kind of gave him a traffic uh, violation october 4th 2002 2 30 p.m in Fredericksburg, Caroline Sewell is shot loading bags into her minivan at a craft store. The bullet hits her in the lower right side of her back and exits under her left breast and is embedded in the rear of the minivan. Her emergency doctor says that the bullet missed her heart by a few centimetres and had shredded parts of her liver. Caroline would later say, I felt pain through my back, then my front, heard the noise almost simultaneously and I knew immediately that I had been shot. I first prayed, first said a prayer that God would not let me die. The 7th of October 2002, 8.08 a.m. 13-year-old Iron Brown skips usual prayer service at a neighbour's house and has his aunt drive him to school. As he approaches the front door of Benjamin Tasker Middle School, he is shot once in the chest and crumples to the ground. His aunt, a nurse, scoops him up and drives him to a nearby hospital. Luckily, he survives. Police search a wooded area less than 150 yards from the school. They find a .223 caliber shell casing and a deft tarot card. On it, John had written, Call me God in the front, and on three separate lines in the back, For you, Mr. Policeman, call me God. Do not release to the press. Other than conflicting reports of a white van, a white box truck, and a dark Chevrolet Caprice near the scenes of the incidents, police had no clear leads. The point about someone stating that there was a dark Chevrolet Caprice near the scene. There's a recent Channel 4 documentary, it's a six-parter called I Sniper, The Washington Killers, and uh, it's very, very good. But in the early episode, there's a news interview with a gentleman who's adamant that it was, you know, I don't know why they're looking for a white van. It was a dark Chevrolet Caprice. It looked sketchy leaving the parking lot. And this is right at the start of Obviously, we're kind of mid-timeline here. 
he's adamant, but they just discounted this guy because they were so convinced. Was it adamant? No, wasn't adamant. Oh, he said it. Okay, sorry. That's what... He said it was adamant. Oh. 8th of October 2002, Baltimore police stop a vehicle driving erratically in the early morning. The driver identified himself as John Mohammed. John Lee Malvo is also in the car. A background check is run and it indicates that Mohammed has no outstanding warrants. They were both let go. On the 9th of October 2002 at 8.18pm, Dean Myers is shot and killed at Sunoco petrol station whilst filling up his car. This is now three people that have been gunned down at a petrol station. It created a lot of panic, a lot of chaos. People would actually fear filling their cars up. I'm a bit like now. It fueled the fire um, yeah. to the actual, you know, how scared people were. But some people would try and fill up out via the window and do really? it that way yeah also they don't hide below their car but yeah people were literally living in because yeah because like i said before the, there wasn't a clear you know person they were going for anyone no, was no. it was fair game to them so that anyone could have been a victim people <coughs> only were reported crossing roads in like zigzags because they're actually generally worried about yeah, yeah. yeah the 11th of october 2002 9 30 a.m kenneth bridges is shot and killed at exxon petrol station authorities shut down entrance ramps to i-95 and route one so apparently a witness across the street from the exxon station on route one in fredericksburg said he heard a single shot and saw a white van nearby which white vans are everywhere they are, mate. i mean even driving here ben we probably saw what couple one a few yeah easily several. one not several ben that's that means 28 yeah How's they, your they white are. Van, ben? Oh, very, you know, unrelated Ooh. to this case, but yeah, really good, really good. You talk about it, Ben. Go on. Uh, oh, well, okay, so we're here. I uh, recently purchased a camper van, a van conversion, and uh, it's white and was not in Washington. Live life a little bit and uh, have some adventures. Where are you going to go? Uh, I'm going to get a spare tyre first before I go anywhere. Don't want to risk that. No, yep. no spare. Thinking the coast first, give it a little run. Yeah. Maybe Felix, though. Just easy. Yeah. Nice, go to Red Scotland, Ireland, oh, Wales. Going with anyone? Is it a single who, bed, double who, bed? Uh, it's a double bed, a large queen, I believe, <laughs> and me. So, yeah, but you boys, are you're more than welcome. Probably can fit all three of us in. There's a little sofa bed as well, so it can, you know, we, we were thinking about doing a, a, a little tour. Were well, we? Taking the, taking the podcast live. Uh, well, you know, again, were well, we? Uh, number, number one in the charts, um, you know. True crime charts, UK. True crime charts. Tra- True, true crime true chart in the UK, uh, number five. Uh, yeah, I can do some sausages. I'll do some Linda, Linda, Linda sausages. I want Richmond veggie sausages. I'll get you some. They oh, good. they are quite nice. Are actually, king? Yeah. You have that then? You have? No, you have. On your stag do? Yeah, I did. You know, if if a white van drives past, it might be me in my camper, having a good time, having a trip. It's got windows. It's got windows. Yeah, you can see out, but you can't see in. Oh. What? Well, that's good. That means we can do whatever we want in there. I don't want to be in there doing Who's we? Yeah. Us three. We're not going to be in there. Yeah, we will. We don't have to do whatever we want. <laughs> we don't have to do whatever we want. <laughs> October 14th, 2002, 9.15pm. An FBI analyst, Linda Franklin, is shot and killed whilst leaving the Home Depot in Falls Church, Virginia, with her husband. Linda's husband recalls feeling something hit his face and later realising that it was his wife's blood. When Linda collapses, he calls 911, telling the operator that she had been shot in the head. The bullet split open Linda's skull, forcing out part of the brain. About 25 minutes after Franklin was shot, an off-duty Fairfax County police officer said that she saw Malvo driving a dark blue Chevrolet Caprice in Interstate 66, which was less than 10 miles from the scene of the crime. So yeah, this is potentially them reaching stage two now, a uh, police officer. Traffic was backed up because police had put up roadblocks after the shooting, and the officer exchanged a glance with Malvo, who was driving. She reported did not see anyone else in the car. So again, now, although no fingers could be pointed to John Mohammed pulling the trigger in any of these murders, this potentially means that maybe he did because Malvo was driving and John couldn't be found. The 17th of October, 2002, a clergyman receives a phone call from a man who says he knows who killed a woman shot by the sniper in Falls Church. The man also mentions a shooting in Montgomery at a liquor store and quotes from the tarot card found near the high school where the sniper shot a 13-year-old boy. The caller told the pastor to write down the phrase, Dear Mr. Policeman, call me God, do not release to the press. 
October 19th, 2002, 7.59pm. Jeffrey Hopper is shot and wounded, leaving a Ponderosa steakhouse. Investigators find a note tacked to a tree, demanding money and instructing the police to call at a certain time and place. The phone number provided in the note was not valid, but technicians at the US Secret Service Crime Lab were able to match the handwriting to the tarot card left at the high school. The clergyman calls police with a tip after seeing this shooting on the news. The murder in Montgomery mentioned in the call had not yet been linked to the series of shootings. Investigators were able to identify fingerprints and ballistic evidence that were available from the case. So I believe what they also did was find bullets within tree stumps that they were also able to then conduct ballistics analysis on that matched and were consistent with the other bullets found. These two don't match. I'm stumped. It's good. I hope this gets easier. Mm. Are we barking at the wrong tree? They're all, they are all good. This case is a birch. Birch. That's all right, yeah. Pussy will I? The 20th of October 2002, the following morning, the fingerprint database produced a match. A magazine dropped to the crime scene bore the fingerprints of Lee Boyd Malvo from a previous arrest in Washington state. The arrest record provided another important lead, mentioning a man named John Allen Mohammed. FBI agents from Tacoma recognised the name from a tip called into their office on the case. A fellow mechanic, Robert Holmes, who had noticed certain things that made him question, you know, whether or not John could be involved in this, talking about uh, Malvo and his shooting skills and, you know, training and all this stuff. He kind of put one on one together there. Yeah. and uh, But yeah, this call, it was, you know, there's thousands of calls and tips they received beforehand, so it kind of got lost in all the other noise. Yeah. Um, that's it. Robert Holmes is the one of the heroes of this case. So he was a longtime friend of John Mohammed's from the army days. He'd called that hotline multiple times whilst the rest of the press and police forces still believed it was white men in white vans. He was adamant that, no, I know who this is. I know why they're doing it. But continually, they weren't taking his, his information seriously. An FBI agent gathered that evidence and quickly flew to Washington, D.C. The FBI and ATF jointly obtained a federal material witness warrant for him. John and Malvo had also been observed target shooting at a residence in Tacoma, which was actually uh, Robert Holmes, which further linked them to the sniper case. So they went out to Robert Holmes's home, saw the, uh, the bullets that they had been using, and the predictions of criminal profilers were shown to be wildly incorrect as the suspected snipers were an African-American man and Caribbean teenager. 21st of October 2002, police receive a call from the snipers and trace it to Exxon payphone in Glen Allen, Virginia. Two illegal immigrants are arrested, but no connection to the attack is discovered and later released. October 22nd, 2002, 5.56am. Conrad Johnson, a bus driver, is shot and killed standing on the top step of his Montgomery County ride-on bus. So at this point, obviously, they're aware of who they're looking for, but they cannot find John or Malvo anywhere. FBI search criminal records database and find that Mohammed had registered a blue Chevy Caprice with the license plate of NDA 21Z in New Jersey, and this description was given to the news media. So at the time, they're obviously demanding $10 million and they'll bring an end to all of these murders, but now they know who they're looking for, mm. who the killers are, and they widely publicize the, both their uh, license plate as well as their, their images. 23rd of October 2002, an image of John Mohammed is faxed to the Sniper Task Force and investigators identify the make, model and plate of Chevrolet Caprice that the suspect is driving. Acting on a phone tip, authorities serve warrants at the home where Malvo and Mohammed once lived in Tacoma. Neighbours had complained in January that Mohammed routinely did target practice in his backyard. Police then remove items from the yard, including a tree stump, for forensic tests. Authorities also issue a nationwide alert for a blue 1990 Chevrolet Caprice with New Jersey license number NDA21Z. Montgomery Police Chief Charles Moose, who is frequent throughout this case, he gets incredibly emotional at various press conferences. He announces that an arrest warrant has been issued for Mohammed on charges not related to the sniper case and that Mohammed might be traveling with a juvenile. On the 24th of October 2002 at 12.54 a.m., a civilian spots Malvo and Mohammed sleeping in the Caprice at the I-70 rest stop. Within the hour, law enforcement swarm the scene, setting up a perimeter to check out any movements and make sure there'd be no escape. The FBI takes them into custody at 3.30 a.m. They found that the car had a hole cut out in the trunk near the license plate so the shots could be fired from within the vehicle. Also found in the car were the Bushmaster um, that had been used in each attack, a rifle scope for taking aim and a tripod to steady the shots. A back seat that had a sheet metal removed between the passenger compartment and trunk, enabling the shooter to get into the trunk from inside the car. 
the Chevy Caprice owner's manual, which had written impressions of one of the demand notes, so the kind of the outline of the handwriting on the other demand notes, the digital voice recorder used by both Malvo and John to make extortion demands, a laptop stolen from one of the victims containing maps of the shooting sites and getaway routes from the some of the crime scenes, and maps and walkie-talkies. John is arraigned on a preliminary federal weapons law violation charge, and Malvo is held as a material witness and juvenile in Baltimore. 25th of October 2002, Montgomery County, Maryland prosecutors announced that John and Malvo will face six first-degree murder charges and that they will seek the death penalty for John Muhammad. On the 29th of October 2002, Virginia prosecutors file capital murder charges against John Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo. So again, it's multiple states and districts that are getting involved, multiple police forces. On the 15th of January 2003, Charles Maxfield, a juvenile court judge in Fairfax County, rules that Lee Boyd Malvo will be tried as an adult in the death of FBI analyst Linda Franklin. On the 17th of September 2003, Judge Jane Maron Roche rules the death penalty as possible punishment for Malvo if he is convicted. On the 17th of November 2003, John Muhammad is found guilty of three charges, including one count of capital murder. On the 24th of November 2003, a Virginia Beach jury sentences John Muhammad to death for the murder of Dean Myers. On the 18th of December 2003, a jury finds Malvo guilty of capital murder terrorism and use of a firearm in the October 14th shooting of FBI analyst Linda Franklin and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. As part of a deal with prosecutors, Malvo later pled guilty in additional cases but was spared the possibility of a death sentence by a 2005 US Supreme Court ruling that declared that capital punishment for a juvenile offender to be unconstitutional. So that was the timeline of the DC snipers. We're now going to throw to our resident doctor, Dr. Das of Acyclosaur Mines, for his clinical overview on the DC snipers. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I act as an expert witness for criminal trials. And I'm also the host of a YouTube channel called A Psych for Sore Minds. This is my psychoanalysis of the DC snipers. What I think is quite interesting is the prosecution suggested before the trial that Mr. Muhammad intended to kill his second ex-wife, who was called Mildred, because he felt that she had estranged him from his children. And apparently he'd made threats to her earlier. According to this theory, the shootings were a cover-up so that he could eventually kill his wife and he wouldn't be a suspect because all of these random, seemingly random killings occurred in the same area. Now, I should say that this theory wasn't actually accepted by the judge, but if it is true, then to me, this shows this monumental lack of empathy and lack for respect for human life. So usually serial killers, they have some kind of compulsion and sometimes they have a, a sexual urge that they feel that they, they just have to quench and they go and you know commit these killings. Even though some serial killers do get perverse pleasures, they also feel some level of guilt. Whereas Muhammad had none of this, if that theory is true. He was literally very cold and calculating. And the very fact that these killings kept on going for a prolonged per period of time indicates to me that it wasn't impulsive. This, this was an act of convenience. From a psychiatric point of view, another aspect of this case that interests me is that the younger man, Malvo, while he was imprisoned, he apparently wrote a number of erratic diatribes talking about jihad against the United States. And during his rants and drawings, he mentioned lots of people, including Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, and characters from The Matrix. In my opinion, this potentially indicates that he might have been psychotic. So just very briefly, psychosis is when you take a step out of reality. It's usually in the form of auditory hallucinations, like hearing voices, or delusions, which are ununderstandable, fixed beliefs that don't really make sense. I can't really make the call about whether he was psychotic or not without assessing him in person, but if I did assess him in person, I'd really want to dig deeper into what he felt his connection was to these people, to you know the Matrix characters, to Osama bin Laden. So if he was just inspired by them, in a kind of non-psychotic, twisted fantasy way, then there's no mental illness there. But if he felt that he was connected to them in any way, so if he felt that he was hearing their voices or that they were communicating with him or he could share their thoughts, then this would be barn door obvious symptoms of psychosis. And this is common in the kind of uh, patients that I assess for criminal trials. I just think it's an interesting point. I've assessed several hundred, probably up to a thousand criminal cases in my career. And I have to say The Matrix, the movie, actually comes up relatively regularly. And it makes sense to me because the belief system that there's this big conspiracy that you know the truth about, but nobody else does, very much ties into the belief system of psychosis. 
I've talked about whether Malvo had psychosis or not. I think the next logical question is, does it matter? Why should people care? What difference does it make? And I think that in theory, if he was psychotic at the time, then he could be sent to a psychiatric unit instead of prison. So it would be the equivalent of Broadmoor, which is a high secure hospital in the UK, as you probably know. Would it be sensible to send him to a place like this if he was psychotic? I suppose the pros of sending him there was that if he did have symptoms, he'd be treated against those symptoms. Although what he did was horrific, if he has symptoms of mental illness and they can be treated, then I think as a society we have a responsibility to do that. But having said that, I think the counter argument is this. He's got six consecutive life sentences. He will never be released from prison. So I think it's fair to ask the question, what would be the point? What's the point of investing so much time and, and money and resources into a high secure hospital when he's never going to be released into society? When I think about this case, another aspect that really intrigues me is to what degree did Muhammad exploit Malvo? So the age of criminal responsibility in Washington is 10. That's the same age as it is in the UK. And the age of sexual consent, because they were lovers, is 16, unless there's more than a 60 month difference between the two people. So at the time of the shootings, Muhammad was aged 41 and Malvo was aged 17. So there was a 24 year age gap. So that would be outside of the sexual consent ages. By the way, I hope you guys appreciate the research that I had to do to find this all out for you because that's tainted my browser history forever. So I just want to be really clear, I'm not suggesting that Malvo wasn't responsible for his actions. He was above the, the criminal age of responsibility, 10. I do think he knew what he was doing. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I guess I'm just trying to look at the perspective of the fact that he was quite young and I think he was probably quite vulnerable given his odd mental state. So I wonder whether if he was either coerced or at least pressurised into this ideology of, you know, jihad against the United States. Because I think at 17, he's very impressionable in terms of forming a worldview, especially worldviews that in involve like conspiracy and feeling, you know, marginalized or wronged by society. I think it's, it's hard for a 17 year old to have had enough life experience to think like that. That's the reason that I wonder how, how much he was pressurized by Mr. Muhammad. That in a nutshell is my psychoanalysis of this case. I hope you found it interesting. If you're interested in the crossover between true crime and mental illness, then you have to go and check out my YouTube channel. It's called Psych for Sore Minds. I cover a range of topics. Sometimes I dissect high profile cases like this. Sometimes I talk about criminality in general. Sometimes I talk about mental health issues. I've done a recent video about whether suicide is selfish. So I've looked at the pros for that argument and the cons for that argument, and I've given my own conclusion at the end. Okay, that's enough from me. Back to Tom and Ben for the rest of this episode. A big thank you to Dr. Das there for his insights on the case. Very interesting indeed. And now we're going to look at some of the trivia of the case and some aftermath. And then we're going to go into a little bit of light relief, Ben. We are indeed. Because I think this case needs a little bit of light relief. Absolutely. So in November 2009, after John Mohammed had all his appeals um, exhausted, he was then executed by lethal injection. And since spending time in prison, Malvo, it's been said that he kind of did revert back to his childhood a little bit. They said even his, his facial expressions had changed and he got a bit more kind of juvenile and a bit more. It does seem like he was, he was obviously very much moulded by John Mohammed. I mean, he changed his diet. I think they only ate, only ate one meal a day because they thought it was a bit, it'd be better for the body for digestion. They controlled him, obviously, the games he made him play, the shooting. Obviously, Malvo was just seeking John Mohammed's um, approval and, you know, wanting him to be proud of him. It was very much, it did change the way he thought about everything. He became, you know, a cold-blooded killer in a way. I mean, put into prison with people closer to his age and, in, and growing up in that kind of area, Apparently he's changed as a person completely in terms of his mannerisms and just the way he is. It's apparently it's night and day. And in that series you mentioned earlier, they do actually have interviews with him. Yeah. And he does mention the fact now he does realise he was very much manipulated. Yeah, he regards himself as being used as an instrument to carry out these these murders. And it is, yeah, it's a really uh, well-made series if if people do get the chance to, to watch it. And it does give kind of first-hand insight from Malvo. He kind of narrates part of the series from interviews from prison. So altogether, they've killed 17 people and injured 10 people. But 10 of those 17 that they killed were killed during the actual Beltway sniper attacks. It was through multiple states and people were just essentially so scared that they wouldn't leave the houses. It gave me a little bit of uh, the Zodiac Killer vibes, mm. the amount of fear of the school buses and yeah, the threats sure. uh, via uh, letters to the press. I mean, there's some of the um, press was saying Al-Qaeda Al Al snipers and stuff like yeah. that because they just believed that it was the link directly to that. Yeah, well, it was no, almost 
almost a year to the day. A year, first year and a month. Year yeah. and a month, exactly, yeah, almost. Um, and two survivors of the shootings and the families of six slain victims brought uh, lawsuits against Bushmaster Firearms, the manufacturer of the rifle using the attacks and the Tacoma, Washington gun store from which the rifle had been stolen. While not a missing fault, Bushmaster and the gun store reached a $2.5 million settlement with the plaintiffs. Another quite interesting thing about Malvo since he's been in, in prison and talking to psychologists, um, one of the psychologists actually testified that Malvo told him he was the spotter not the shooter in all the sniper shootings except for the last one and he would go on to say you know he that Malvo no longer knew right from wrong he suffered from extreme mental and emotional disturbance yeah as I said Malvo kind of started realizing the manipulation he was under but there's a lot of like people that believe you know one did the shooting more than the other or yeah yeah and a lot of people yeah very anti-sane the idea of him being brainwashed I know um Conrad's mum one of the victims she's like completely thinks no he was cold cold mm-hmm. cold hearted killer he just he just did it she's been unable to forgive him which you can completely understand. There was one really interesting part where they, well, it was this came from Malvo. However, they'd both wanted to shoot a child to prove a point during the the rampage. And that was when they shot Iron Brown, the one that miraculously mm. survived. And well, there are images of victims that survived. There are crime scene photos from this case, which again, when you look at them, they look, I mean, this was 2002. They look kind of from the 80s the 90s malvo would state that they wanted to kill someone outside of a school or by school buses to get the nation's attention and it was this particular victim that they almost killed that the then montgomery county police chief charles moose who we mentioned earlier felt so helpless at the point of announcing that a child had been shot that he was forced to cry on national television and it was malvo and Mohammed's belief that this indicated that the snipers meant business that's horrible and one of the one of the big kind of beliefs which i think stacks up here they think they believe the motive is john muhammad wanted to kill his ex-wife in order to get his children back and he believed if he if he killed her first you know obviously when when a spouse or ex-partner they're always the first um, person you suspect so rather than just killing her straight away killing multiple people over this time period and random people mm-hmm. no one would look at him because they, they believe it was these killers on the run and he was doing this in order to kill his wife and get and get away with killing with his wife and then get gain custody back of his children. That's what people believe is the, the overarching motive. When I, you kind of believe that. I mean, there's yeah. other things as well that he believed and other people just believe that um, John Muhammad wanted to hit back at the world. He did go on to teach Malva about how he believed the white government were oppressing black people and how the treatment of black people in the history, how they need to get their revenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, A quote from John Muhammad said, I want them to know what it feels like to feel helpless. I want to take from them as much as they have taken from me. This nation, this system, they took our language, they took our identity, they took everything. So yeah, there's a lot of built up anger. And this is again information that he's cascading, he's teaching to John Malvo, obviously a youngster wanting to learn as much about life. And John Muhammad, I would say he's quite happy in the role of a teacher or an instructor or or guiding someone. After John Muhammad's arrest, authorities also claimed that he admitted that he admired and modelled himself on Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and he would approve of the September 11 attacks. Uh, The front page of the Washington Post during uh, the first wave of attacks read snipers and Al-Qaeda. So again, a lot of witnesses would point the finger at terrorists from the Middle East. There was also multiple witnesses that stated they could see gunmen holding AK-47s to their shoulder. So again, I don't know if this is just snowball effect. Making matters worse, there had also been an anthrax scare in Washington at the time, which five people had lost their lives. Tom mentioned people argue, did Malvo pull the trigger? Did John Muhammad pull the trigger? Would Malvo have ever killed if he didn't meet John Muhammad? And I guess at the end of the day, they were the only two inside that car. They are the only two that truly know who yeah, pulled the trigger. I think, obviously, yeah, this is going to be, you know, everyone has their opinion on the case, but Malvo didn't portray any behaviour, or that far as I could see growing up, which would indicate he would go down this path. Mm-hmm. He was taken in by an older man, taught him how he believed about everything he got him to watch the matrix over a hundred times told him he's living in you know not a real world he's completely manipulated him yeah. into being this person well there are also the allegations that john muhammad sexually abused malvo numerous times mm. as well but then you can argue malvo had every opportunity to leave throughout this yeah, that's rampage like, that's not saying someone in an abusive relationship they had every chance to leave when the, when the escalation happens i know he's framing it as training but surely if his moral compass, I know he's been manipulated by this role model, but if he realised, right, actually, this is hurting people. 
I'm out. Then he's good to be very much again. He used to yeah. be scared of scared of him and scared of where can I go. This is the only person that's got looking after me. I haven't got anywhere I can go. And if I do, you know, who knows what he said to him behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. It's one of those where yeah, only those two people are going to know what, what was said behind closed doors, everything like that. But yeah, yeah, I think yeah, so it's very hard to say, obviously. It was never proven that John Mohammed pulled the trigger in any of the 23 shootings. He was prosecuted under the Triggerman statute, which states that if the suspect was in direct cause or the causing agent when someone was killed, then they should also be held equally responsible. There's, I mean, there's loads of stuff. This is a very big case. There's loads of information out there. There's a six-part series. Each episode's like an hour long. There's loads of documentaries, podcasts, websites that are dedicated. It's, there's a lot of Zodiac similarities. There are people that are obsessed with this case and all the different bits of information. Information. There's also a lengthy website that talks about all of Malvo's actions since being incarcerated and all these apology letters that he's written. He does art. He's currently incarcerated at the Red Onion State Prison. He's written to each and every one of his victims and surviving victims to apologise and to the families of those that didn't survive. Okay, so yeah, this is time for our little bit of light relief. Um, before we did look at uh an interesting thing during this time, the pizza restaurants reported a surge in li- delivery requests because people feared about stepping outside the front door. That would have been a scary time to deliver pizzas. Yeah. I don't know if you uh, had to say that because it's fairly obvious. Yeah. Fairly obvious. But you go on, man, do you want to do your look alikes for this week? All right. I uh, struggled this week. I'll be honest. I think nah. I think, yeah, I, well, I struggled this week. Um, right, I've got one then for John Allen Mohammed. Sure. I've gone for a, a fantastic television series. You love The Sopranos. I've gone for a series that the makers of The Sopranos were involved with. Uh, it's a HBO prison series called Oz. John Allen Mohammed looks like Michael Wright, who played Omar White in the excellent series Oz. You show me it? Yeah, that's not too bad. But in that particular photo, I also, for some reason, in uh, uh, John Allen Mohammed, see a tiny bit of Jesus Quintana, the bowling Jesus from the Big Lebowski. Uh, it's a stretch, I'll be honest, but I see it in that photo for some reason. A Hispanic man. Yeah, just in the face, just in the face. There, I see it a little bit. Yeah, I don't see it. You don't see it. No. Okay. Uh, would you like to do yours for John yeah. Allen Mohammed? Yeah. It's on my, it's on my phone here. Sorry. Sorry. Apologies to. I believe he looks like. Here, this picture here. Yeah. A young Ian Wright. Very good. And I think it looks a lot like Eddie Steeples, who was a, an actor in uh, My Name is Earl. Yeah, that's very good. I think, guys, I think Tom's beat me this week. For Malvo, I struggled. I went, uh, he looks a tiny bit like a black Kurt Angle. <laughs> it's just... It's just a bad shout. And then my other bad shout for Lee Malvo is I think that he looks like, and this is not his most notable work, but it's the one that stayed in my mind. He looks a little bit like Anthony Anderson, who was one of the sons in Me, Myself and Irene. That's not a terrible shout. Yeah, there are better photos that kind of link up nicely. There it is. That is the case of the DC Snipers. Thank you once again to all the new listeners and all the OGs. We are very happy to be back and we have a lot of exciting cases for you. Very big one next week. And the following week, we'll be doing the case, the case you guys picked. Yeah, the votes have been... I mean, we're all, all on airplane mode right now. Dan's on flight simulator. Um, <laughs> but uh, the votes have been kicking off big time, guys. There's actually been a couple of little scraps bubbling under the surface. But we can't wait to see who comes out on top. And if, if you aren't already and you want to be involved in the next series vote, why not follow us on Instagram, Twitter? You, at, probably, you probably got three months to wait. But, but we'll be populating the uh the feed during those three months so yeah uh, if you have joined us uh, and the the episode vote has already happened of course because it's happening as we speak why not consider following us on our socials at could murder a pod which is twitter and instagram it facebook sure just search i could murder a podcast yeah, and we'll probably pop up tom yep uh, and as tom mentioned at the start we have got tons of extra exclusive content over on our patreon page which is patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod any support over there is massively massively appreciated and if you want to support us and get something for yourself want to head over to the icmap.store where we have hats mugs jumpers badges stickers that front picture kind of thing you can see but we've got that picture over here mm-hmm. a bit of a poster tote bags number yeah tote bag well loads of things over there so why not head over there candles candles and pick, pick up yourself something physical that you can hold and touch and we deliver to everywhere don't we we do so indeed so i ask us to deliver to canada earlier. worldwide there you go so yeah thank you very much everybody thank you so much for the the audio listeners the youtube viewers we appreciate all of you new and old and a big thank you once again to dr das and gully garms and we'll be back again next week with a fresh case and until then guys like we always say we say this all of the time 
keep doing what you're doing. Well, unless it's, you know, too much. Real time flight simulator. simulator yeah. Flying to Australia. Yeah. Um, too much of that. Boring, isn't it? Um, Shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's fun. All right, mate. Dan's just want to have fun. Anyway, guys, two pip. All best. Meow. That did sound pretty cool. Thanks. Let's go play flight simulator. <laughs> Prince Charming. Prince Charming. Hey, no, stand, stand and deliver. That'll be better, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's next line. Stand on your liver. But it's only this time that it's happening. My ear seems really sensitive. Did, it go did I shout, Dan? I mean, it was quite dynamic, yeah. But I mean, but it's, sorry about it's, that. Maybe just me. If you can tell them right down the mine. No, because my ears are no, really no, sensitive. No, if, if your ears are sensitive, it's